Grab your Bibles. I have a brief word I want to share with you um, as we move into the message this morning. Um, before you do that, turn to the person to your, that's sitting next to you and say to them, say, neighbor, prayer changes things. Yeah, turn to the other person. Say, other person, prayer changes things. Now, y'all do me a favor. Point, point upwards towards heaven and say, God, deliver me from myself. Yeah, amen, amen. Let us pray, then we're going to go to the Word. God, you're wonderful. God, you're gracious. God, you're kind. You're awesome. And so as we stand to say, thus said the Lord, I'm praying that you would just open our hearts to hear from you. We want to be your people, God. We want to, to just move the way you would have us to move. So we give this to you, that you get the praise, you get the honor, you get the glory, Lord. So as we share, I am praying that your spirit would move a fresh line. We, we, we don't pray for this morning's anointing. We pray for today's anointing for this group of people that are here because you want to speak to them. So we bless you. We give our hearts to you. We pray that you would move and have your way in our midst as we give this service to you. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. And we're going to go to the book of Chronicles in a little while. Thank you, Dominique. Amen. Thank the musicians. Come on, show them some love and appreciation that God would move and have his way. Um, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 kind of tells us that... that um, it says it this way, that death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? And most of you have probably heard the statement, there is creative power in words. Um, if you've been in, in church or if you've been living or if you've been around any length of time in your life, you've probably heard the statement of the fact that there's the truth that there's creative power in words. And what that means is that the more we say things, the more we believe it, the more we hear things, about ourselves, the more we believe it, and then it becomes a part of who we are. Come on, can we be honest this morning? And we start either walking that thing out or living it or starting manifesting a lot of what we hear about either ourselves or of others that the, these words start to form. They're very formative, and they start, start to shape, shape um, or form our behavioral patterns. Um, I, I have a, a great example of this. In my own family, I have a younger brother. And in, in my family, my younger brother had a rough start in life. By, and what I mean by that is that he wasn't the most disciplined kid growing up. He wasn't the most well-mannered kid growing up. And he wasn't the most well-behaved. So here's how that played itself out. Um, within our household, we would say negative things to him. Man, you're not going to amount to nothing. Come on, you, you're not going to turn out well. You're going to be the worst this. You're going to be the worst that. And, and we would speak into this child, even from a little boy growing up, we would always say negative things. Why? Because he always found himself in trouble over something. You kind of get what I'm saying. The sad commentary about that statement is that as life ensued and my brother grew up, he started living out what we were saying to him. You kind of get what I'm saying. And, and it's not that we were speaking life into him. It's not that we were encouraging him to excel or to be better. We, we looked at his behavioral pattern, and we ended up speaking words that defined his character, if that makes any sense. So sure enough, John uh, is his name. He ends up growing up. And as he ends up growing up, he gets married. He gets a family. He starts living life, and his pattern has been always getting in trouble. I would never forget being in, um, in school as he was coming up in school. My sister, who was before me, was a very, very smart young lady. She was always valedictorians of just about every school that she attended, and I had the, the unfortunate privilege of following her, right? And so my, my, the former professors or teachers would see her and how intelligent she was, and then they would say to me, Felix, what's your problem, right? You kind of get it. So the heat was on, and I had to perform because she carried the Gilbert name. And then after me was this brother that really couldn't compete with her nor myself, and he would bear the brunt of that. So, so here's what would happen. Even his teachers would speak negatively into him. And they weren't speaking life into him. And I'll never forget one instant he got so frustrated uh, in his school days that he actually hit a teacher and ended up being thrown out of school. Well, to make a long story short, this young man ended up in jail. He ended up choosing a path that was not right, that was not the way he, uh, God would have us to be or God would have him to be raised. And he ended up, I think it was getting 10-year sentence 
to prison for the character he had developed. And I think, I, I, I feel guilty saying this, but it's been based on what we were calling him as a child growing up. You get it? Where we could have helped turn things around, we could have redefined some words, we could have referred to him in different terms, but because of what we chose, it ended up being formative for him, and he chose a path that was not healthy. Well, any of you who know anything about Old Testament biblical um, history, you also know that in the Old Testament, most of the biblical characters have names that are reflective of the character that they should have, right? So here's what would happen. A child would be born, and the mother or father would name that child based on the character trait either the parent exemplified or the mother exemplified during birth, and that character name or that name would end up being formative for that person. So in other words, name in the Old Testament can almost be synonymous with the word character. If you were to look at Noah, I mean Adam, Adam was named man because he was the first man created, right? Eve, the mother of all living. You see how the name is reflective of their character trait. If you were to look at Moses, his name means to be drawn out. Why? Because he was drawn out of the Nile. And if you look at his missional assignment in life, it was to go to Pharaoh to tell him to let God's people go to draw them out of Israel, right? Jacob, I mean the name Jacob, right? Surplanter trickster. And why did they call him that? Because as his brother Esau was coming out, here he was grabbing onto his brother's heel, so they named him supplanter. They called him trickster, right? And then later on, when God got a hold of him, his name was then transferred to Israel, which means God fights for me. So don't miss that. He had a birth name, and then as he continued to grow, when he encountered God, God changed his name. Come on now. Um, even Joshua, right, Savior. So when you look at the Bible, you will find that the majority of these Old Testament patriarchs, they have a name that normally is symbolic to the behavioral pattern, the character trait that they exemplify. So today I want to look at a very, very familiar passage of Scripture in front of us. A passage that speak that you've all heard, you all heard. Matter of fact, it's, it's, anybody ever heard of the prayer of Jabez? Oh, come on, y'all too quiet. Y'all ever heard that? Yeah. You've heard that. Matter of fact, the, the author of that, that wrote the book, um, Bruce Wilkinson, I believe his book sold some 2 million plus copies because I don't know that you can ever encounter a person, uh, at least in Christendom, that have not yet uh, read that story. And I want to look at that briefly because I think for a majority of us, when we encounter that story, we focus in on the blessing, right? God, enlarge my territory. God, make my name great. And a lot of us pray, pray that prayer that God would do this for me. God would open doors. It's almost as if we treat him as if he is a cosmic genie, but we're not willing to do the formative work that's required to be able to handle the blessings that he has in store for us, right? So more times than often, when we hear the story, it's always about the blessing that's associated with Jabez, but it's never about the process that Jabez had to undergo to even to be a recipient of the blessing. You kind of get where I'm going. So I want to take just a few minutes of your time to share just this one thought um, from this passage this morning that hopefully will enlighten you to see some things differently. So go with me to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And I want to walk you through this and then we'll talk through this so we can see what God is moving and saying. So 1 Chronicles chapter 4, let's look at this and let me give you a little bit of literary context to walk you up to the passage so we could see what God is doing and what God is saying. If you look at, before you get to chapter 4, chapter 1, Chronicles is simply that. It's a chronicle that is filled with the genealogies of a lot of the Old Testament saints. So chapter 1 begins with from Adam to Abraham. So you see a list of fathers and sons and descendants of that lineage. When you get to chapter 2... You see, the author, the chronicler, now speaks to the lineage of David. And he gives us a list of all the descendants, all the sons, 
all the heirs that are part of the lineage of David's household. Chapter 3 starts to narrow down a little bit as it relates to the descendants of David. And then chapter 4 focuses specifically on the tribe of Judah, Judah, which is birthed out of the lineage of David. Now, when you look at chapter 4, just like the preceding chapters, all it is, it's, it's difficult to read. Dare I even use the word boring, right? Because uh, you're looking to this, and you're looking for meat. You're looking for substance. And if you had made the commission to read the Bible from beginning to end, you get to Chronicles. You're yawning, or you're falling asleep, or you're hurrying up to skip through it, right? Because all it is is name after name after name after name. And you're like, who are these people? Who is that one? Never heard. Come on, can we be honest this morning? Amen. But then in, in chapter 4, as you're reading this list of names and descendants, right in, not even the middle, up on the first half of the chapter, the chronicler takes a pause in verse 9 because he feels now that the individual that he is about to mention plays a critical and significant role such that you've got this book that was written about these two verses that I think a lot of us have memorized. And I think I'm even comfortable in saying that when it was prominent during its era in the early 2000s, everybody was going around quoting the prayer of Jabez. Y'all come on, say amen. So I want us to look at that just for a moment to see what is it about Jabez? What is it? Look at verse 9. Because if you were to read scripture, this is the only place in in the Bible that you will find any information about this young man, right? The other place you might see his name mentioned is in reference to a city that was named after him um, based on either his life's accomplishment, but you'll see that mentioned there. So look at what verse 9 says. Verse 9 says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, Jabez saying, because I bore him in pain. Jabez called upon the name of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. And the passage or the history of the chronicler as it relates to Jabez says this, And God granted what he asked. Some of your translation says, God granted his request. Now, if if we were to look and take a moment to process this young man by the name of Jabez. What were his life struggles? What is his story? To find any information about him, we would have to make reference to extra biblical material or to Jewish history and culture to hear what the Jewish traditions were as it relates to who Jabez was. So when you look at verse 9, here's how the first part of the text opens up as it relates to um, his life's circumstances, right? We have, he was from um, Cos, who was his dad, in verse 8. It lists some of his brothers, and then the chronicle pauses in verse 9, and he says this, but Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. I find that interesting because of all the names from chapter 1 up until chapter 4, this is the first pause, right? And then here's a description without saying his childhood, his educational acumen, without listing any of that, he simply says he was more honorable than his brother. Now, for any of us to try to attempt to understand or determine what that means, we, we're, we're just dealing with speculation based on Jewish traditions as we have no biblical scripture to verify what honorable meant. So here's what the Jew says. He was probably a community leader of sorts. He was probably a person that had great teaching giftings, and they would say that the rabbis and the scribes, they would sit at his feet to hear what he had to say. He kind of modeled what this life was, and later on in his life, and don't miss that I'm saying later on, he achieved some sort of status as a community leader or as a person that had impact in the community. So they said, based on causes descendants, when you get to Job, Jabez, Jabez, J- Jabez made a name for himself. Come on, are you with me? He made a name for himself. But now, look at the B part. The B part said, and his mother 
called his name Jabez. Why? She's saying, because I bore him in what? Pain. Now, we ought not miss that little bit of detail because I think that shapes his prayer and it plays a critical role in us understanding the rest of the text, right? If you were to go back with me to Genesis chapter 35, here's what you would find. Most of you would remember Rachel. Rachel, on, when she was given birth to her last son, it was on her deathbed that she was given birth to the boy. And while the child was being born or was born, she died shortly after. But before she died, here's what she named him, Ben-Onai, which simply means son of my sorrow. So here's what that meant. If, if, if you listen to my introduction and what I just shared with you earlier, where in the Bible, name signifies character. Here is what that meant for this last child of Rachel that was born. Whenever his dad saw him and he pronounced the name, the Hebrew name, Ben-Onai, it would say to him, you are the one who caused your mama to die so you can be born. Son of my sorrow. So whenever the name was uttered, whenever he encountered the son, guess what happened? He would remember the pain of his favorite woman. Come on, his favorite girl. And it would remind him of the pain. So here's what the mama says. Your name is called son of my sorrow. But listen to what happened. Listen to what happened. Uh, Jacob comes on the scene after she names him. And Jacob renames him. Come on, y'all know this. He renames him to Benjamin, saying that he is now the son of my right hand. So as opposed to this boy walk around reminding the world this character defect of you're the cause of your mama's death, all of a sudden he's now positioned to a place of prominence because his daddy renamed him. I wish I had somebody in here. Is this making sense? His daddy, because his daddy said, there's no way you, you're going to grow up bearing that character defect. There is no way when people hear your name, they're going to remember what happened to your mama. There's no way I'm going to allow you to live life in that path. So he renamed him. Is this making sense? So now when we get to Jabez, notice what the text says about Jabez. Look with me at verse 9. Notice what it says. It says here, she named him, called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him, how? In pain. In pain. Now, we don't know, once again, what the specifics of her pain was. But if you were to look at Genesis chapter 3, when women sin, here's what God said, right? Through pain, toilful pain, you're going to give birth to children. So once again, commentators and theologians speculate that the pain she encountered, meaning that she had such a laborious birthing process, or maybe she had struggles in life during her pregnancy. Maybe she had some hard challenges as she was carrying this child in her womb. We don't know what the circumstances was, but we do know it was such that when the child was born, here's how she named him. You are going to remind me of the pain that I went through. So she named him Jabez. And it's a, prayer, a play on Hebrew words because that's very, very close or synonymous, just a flipping of a few letters to the Hebrew words that literally mean pain. So here's what it meant for Jabez in the majority of his early childhood. Whenever a person encountered him, here's what they would say to him, painful. Okay. Whenever they saw him, painful. You were the cause of your mother's pain. You were the cause of the struggle you went through. Come on now. Does that sound like my brother? Come on. Nobody was speaking positive in his life. Nobody was saying nothing that would encourage him. His name was reflective of his character. And I'm even confident in saying, and we're going to see this in a little while, that wherever he went, he lived out who people said he was. So when they met Jabez, pain. In his leadership, I'm comfortable in saying this, pain. So it's almost as if Jabez had, Jabez had a pattern of causing hurt or hurting people in what he did. Come on, is this making sense? So now look at, look at, look at how he, this is the important part I want you to get. How he fixed the problem. 
So now look at verse 10. And it says here, and Jabez, verse 10, called upon the name of Yahweh Israel, or in your translation, the God of Israel, comma, pause. This is important because if you were to read once again Chronicles chapter 1 all the way to chapter 4, no wonder the author took a pause because this is the first mention of any one of these individuals calling on the name of the Lord. You kind of get what I'm saying? So church, hear me say this to you. Before you can get to blessing, there's a transformation that needs to take place. And the only person or deity that's qualified to make that transformation is God himself. Come on, are you with me? So we must position ourselves when we get to the place where we learn to call on the name of the Lord if change is going to happen. So here's what um, Jewish tradition says again that prompted Jabez to make this transition. He was no doubt being elected, there you go, right, to some position, to some seat. He was no doubt about to become, this is the transforming part in his his life that brings the honor to sit in a seat. And listen to this. He was concerned that he may achieve the position with his skill, but his character would not empower him to maintain it. I hope y'all get that. Because a lot of us are gifted enough to get there. We're not right enough to stay there. Oh, come on, come on, does this make sense? You kind of get what I'm saying? A lot of us are smart enough to achieve the, the financial acumen and the accolades and all that stuff we need to excel in life. But there's always something in us, come on, that, that will prevent us from staying there. So, so w- before he took the seat, here's what he said. He cried out to God, right? And then look at what he said. Look at what he said. He said three things. He said three things. He said this. All that you would bless me and you would enlarge my what? Yeah, yeah. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me help you with that. Let me help you with that. Because you have to keep the framework of leadership in perspective. Here is me when I pray the prayer of Jabez without the exegetical information I'm giving you. It was all about me. I need a bigger house. I need a better car. I need a better job. Come on now. It was selfish motive. And when I got the bigger house, I couldn't make the, poor, the payment. Come on now. When I got the better job, I got fired because I wasn't right yet. And I, would had, I carried the same behavioral patterns that I had in life into the new position. And I couldn't maintain it. So don't miss this. The text is not about individuals prospering. Don't forget me saying he was about to go into a leadership position. And, and, and if you understand anything about Judah, Judah, the, the, the Levites, they were not part of the inheritance for those that were going into Canaan. So if he was a leader, there was a group of people. People that were following and he's saying, God, I can't treat these people well with the little bit of space that I have. I need you to give me a little bit more so everybody can be blessed, not just me. I will. So God, so God, broaden my territory, he says. Come on, say enlarge my territory, God. Say. That's the first thing. The, the, the message is not about that. And then look at the second thing he says. The second thing he says, and oh that your hand might be with me. And oh, that your hand might be with me. Let, me. let me tell you what that means. In the Old Testament, you theologians know this. The Spirit would come. It would land on you. It would empower you for service. And then the Spirit would leave. And then when God had another assignment, the Spirit would come. It would land on you. It would empower you for service. Then it would leave. And Jabez realized that when God was with him, he could behave right. Oh, y'all, y'all not getting this. Yeah, yeah, I get this. He noticed when God was with him, he could lead well. Come on. He could make good decisions. He, he had a reputable character and reputation in the community. But when the hand of God left and he was left to his own devices, he came out. I hope you get this. So God, bring your spirit and don't ever take it. Old Testament, it's not like the spirit indwelled, it rested upon, it empowered when the task which is done is left. So he, he got to this place, Lord, I need you to just to come on me and I need you to stay there permanently so I can be who you would call me to be. And then watch the third thing, watch the third thing. And this is where we're going to hang our head. This is the third thing. And he says, 
that your hand would be on me and that you would keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. I like that. Verse 9. His mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Verse 10d says, God, here's what I need. Keep your hand on me so you would keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. Let me help you out with that. In other words, God, 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 all my life, <laughs> I've been walking around hurting folks. All my life, when I show up, they saw my character before they saw who I was. All my life, this has been the full essence of who I am. So God, I need you to change my name. I wish I had somebody in here. So, so, so in other words, God, I need you to deliver me from myself. You get what I'm saying? Because when people see me, they may encounter my leadership, but... For some shape, form, or fashion, I end up causing more harm than good. You get where I'm going? Come on, come on, talk to me. And so God, if, if I'm going to get to this place this season in my life, to be effective, to be who you've called me to be, to, to be the leader that you need me to be. I can't lead the same way that I was yesterday because when people see me, they see what they heard about me before they see who I really am. So God, I need you to change the name so next time people encounter me, they see me for the name that you have given me, not for the birth name that my mother gave me. Oh, come on, y'all acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know how it is that, that when you go somewhere and you see somebody walking, bruh, let me tell you about him. And you describe his character. And you've got a name for him based on his character. Come on, y'all know I'm talking the truth, right? You go somewhere and you see her, you lean over to your girlfriend, girl, stay away from her. Let me tell you about her. And you describe her character. Oh, wait. And you caution people based on what the community has been calling the individual because it's their birth name. The, the thing that I want to, to bring you aware of that is that though we may think we have name for others, they also have a name for us. So you've got a name too. And the challenge is if we're ever going to get to blessing, listen to what this man is saying. He was named with this character defect based on who he was and his cry to God, if you're going to enlarge my territory, if you're going to keep my hand on me, you can't do it to the same old person. I need you to do a work in me. I need you to deliver me from myself so I can be who you've called me to be. I don't know what your problem is, but my biggest problem is me. Are you hearing me? Or don't act like you're all that. Because your biggest problem is you too. I know you don't believe me. The reason you're not a millionaire right now is not because you didn't have the money. It's because you got in the way. Come on now. The, the, reason, the reason life ha doesn't have you the way you place you should have been right now in life is not because of something holding you back. It's because you got in the way. Come on, talk to me this morning. We are our own worst enemy because we fool ourselves into thinking we can do it all by ourselves. We know ourselves best and we eliminate dependence on God and we live life with our birth name. And when people see you, they see what mama calls you. They see what society calls you. And there comes a point in Jabez. The thing I believe that made him honorable was the fact that he cried out to God and said to him, what? Lord, I need you to change my name. I need you to deliver me from the pain that I have been causing. So here, here's how I say this, right? Jabez's prayer is really this. God, please deliver me from myself, and it's underlined, and then provide the proper resources so I can effectively minister to people. Listen to me, church. If you've not been transformed, 
Don't pray for blessing before the transformation takes place. Why? It's going to be about you and not the people you're called to minister to. Y'all don't believe me, right? This is why prior today, Jabez's prayer was all about your personal blessing. And the reason it didn't come is because you hadn't changed yet. You want a blessing with the name pain. <laughs> and you wonder why you still hurt your wife. You wonder why you still hurt family members. You wonder why you still hurt people in ministry because your name hasn't been changed yet. And God can't provide the resources for effective ministry, whatever ministry may be. It may be in church. It may be in the marketplace. It may be in your community, business, whatever it may be. It begins with a proper character that aligns with God so he can move and have his way. So here's the thought, right? Here's the thought that I want you all to take away. God's power, you get it? can overcome the challenges of yesterday and today to make us who he wants us to be tomorrow. Right? Come on, say amen. Here's how Corinthians 5 and 17 says it. If any person is in Christ, he's a what? What has happened? The old has gone. The new has come. The problem with me and the problem with you and the problem with a lot of us is we came to Jesus just as we were, weary, wounded, and sad. Right? Y'all know the song. We found in him a rested place and he has made us bad. bad and God did his work, but we remained the same because we gave him everything but our name. You get it? There comes a point in time, and I love this, where we must understand that prayer changes things. Here's what I said first service. Had I thought about it, I would have changed that things to say people. <laughs> or, now that I'm thinking about it second service, me. <laughs> Here's me. Lord, change Katani. And I go into tongues, shaka bahasanda, Lord. Change Katani. She didn't cook dinner. Or she hadn't said yes lately. Y'all leave that alone. Amen. Yeah. And so God changed her. Right? As opposed to what? God changed who? You get it? You get it? And if my character is right, my focus is not the external. Makes for a better home, doesn't it? Makes for a better workplace, doesn't it? Makes for a better business. Come on, talk to me. Makes for a better ministry, doesn't it? And then when my heart is right and my character is right, I'm positioned for the blessings from God because it's not about me. It's about the people he has called me to serve. Yeah. Y'all remember my brother John that went to prison for 10 years? I believe it was about, he served seven. And it was about two years into his prison, prison sentence, I went to visit him. I was in Tucson, Arizona, and um, something different about John, right? He's smiling, happy-go-lucky, this, that, and the other. And, and that brother said to me, I deserve what I'm getting. I'm like, dude, what's up with that, right? And then he, here's, here, here's his story. I, I had a Jabez moment when I realized I was the problem. You get it? And so here's my prayer. God changed me. God changed my name. God, deliver me from myself. You get it? He, he served the seven years. I'll never forget. He was supposed to serve 10. He got out early. Good behavior because he was saving everybody in the prison. He was kind of like Paul. <laughs> and, 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 and John gets out. And I'll never forget, um, shortly after his release, I called his parole officer and asked if he could travel to Colorado. And the grace of God, who travels when they just get out of prison, right? They allowed that boy to get on a plane by himself to come and minister to the church that I was serving at the time. John now is positioned in St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. I kid you not, John has the largest federal government contract for ministering to inmates and prisoners who have just got out of prison to help them transition back to society. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me, okay? The largest government contract, okay? Matter of fact, if you know anything about the Virgin Islands, it consists of St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John. He lives on St. Croix. He services those three islands. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not. 
enlarge my territory. I wish I had somebody in here, right? But it begins with your name being changed first. You kind of get, he's probably, if not the most prominent pastor on the island of St. Croix. And we're talking ex-felon. Government contracts? Thank you. Right? So when I say past, right, when I say it doesn't matter what your yesterday was, I wish I had somebody in here. He can change your name. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter who you were. It doesn't matter the failings. It doesn't matter. Come on, the shortcomings, all that stuff. God can change you. But it becomes, it begins with a self-realization that I can't live, keep living in my yesteryear A transformation needs to take place. Remember Jacob? And I'm going to stop with this. Jacob was running from his brother Esau. Genesis 25. Then he got to a place where he couldn't run no more. And he fell asleep and he saw a ladder going up from heaven. The angel came down and was wrestling with him all night. You remember that? His name was Jacob. You remember that? Trickster, supplanter, manipulator. And daybreak came. Y'all remember? Come, y'all know the story. And then, and then the, the angel said to him, let me go. Here's what Jacob said. I won't let you go until you what? Y'all know it. Y'all know it. And here's what the angel said. All right, here's how he blessed him. Your name will no longer be called Jacob. It will be called what? Yeah, Israel, God fights for you. The blessing begins with my character being right so God can use me. So when I pray, God change me so I can be the leader you called me to be. I don't want to hurt people no more. I don't want to cause damages no more. Enlarge my territory, not for me, so the people of God can be blessed. Keep your presence upon me. Why? So I can lead effectively, so I can have the wisdom of Solomon, so I can be the person you've called me to be. That ought to be our prayer. When I say prayer changes things, it begins by changing me. I'm done, but let me say this. If you find yourself in a place where you've been wrestling with life, you might want to look at the name you were dealt with when you entered the earth. Matter of fact, David in 51 of Psalms says, I was shapen in iniquity. And listen to this. And in sin did my mother conceive me. So my default name is sinner. I hope y'all got that. (laughs) I need a name change from sinner to saint so I can start being who God would have me to be, right? Come on, y'all. Is anybody, is is it only me? Come on, is it only me? Is it only me? Is it only me? Is it only me? Come on, worship team. 